I'm delighted uh, to have Kaisa Ekis Ekman here. I'm just going to introduce you, Kaisa. Um, thank you for being here. Kaisa is a Swedish journalist, writer, and activist. She is the author of several works about the financial crisis, critiques of capitalism and women's rights. Her book, Being and Being Bought, Prostitution, Surrogacy and the Split Self, has been translated into several languages and her latest book on the existence of sex, Thoughts on the New Definition of Women, has just been released in Sweden. Thank you very much for being here this evening, Kaisa. We look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, it's an honor to be here. I'm joining you from Spain where somebody's drumming on the street and my daughter is in the back. So if you hear a lot of noise, uh, I'm sorry about that. There's nothing I can do. So um, the big problem with NGOs, I would say, is the reputation. In most people's minds, uh, an NGO means uh, an independent organization working for human rights, i.e. the good guys. So when an NGO takes a stand in some question, people think this is the correct position. I mean, how many articles don't mention in passing that Human Rights Watch says, or you know, Venezuela say, uh, on Venezuela, or Amnesty says on Syria, and, and people don't know what is behind. How has this report been conducted? And that reputation in itself is why NGOs are so attractive to take over by vested interests and why they have been targeted by organized efforts since the 90s and pressured also into taking a stand on more and more issues that don't relate or are not relevant to their core goals. Um, this includes the geopolitical powers of the world. I mean, to have an NGO state, for example, that human rights abuses are going on in a country right before US invasion will take place. It is free war propaganda. It also includes economic interest, for example, when it comes to sex, to the sex industry, which I have researched in my book. So since the 90s, the sex industry has been specifically targeted, uh, specifically targeting NGOs, both with efforts to obtain a favorable position on their issues and to receive funding. So much of this funding, as academic Jennifer Oriel has shown in her dissertation, was given as HIV AIDS prevention and ended up in the hands of the sex industry. So groups have been funded and founded and able to grow, claiming they supported the rights of sex workers and helped prevent the spread of AIDS. When in reality, these rights were about uh, printing leaflets on the wonders of being a prostitute or a sex worker, as they would put it, and prevention meant handing out condoms that buyers wouldn't use anyway, as I was able to see with my own eyes in Barcelona when I was uh, doing research and visiting these centers that claim to help sex workers. Um, it has also been a problem with, for example, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that was going to stop the spread of HIV AIDS in India and ended up donating the money to pro-prostitution organizations which the organization APNA AP were able to highlight and actually stop. Now in the 2000s, these groups uh, had gotten strong enough to start influencing global NGOs. And this is most notable uh, in the case of Amnesty International. So in 2015, after intense lobbying, Amnesty International took a stand arguing for the legalizing or as they would call it decriminalization which basically amounts to the same thing, but the word has a more positive brain. Um, basically, it means the same thing, uh, legalizing of buying sex and pimping. It was a formidable gift to the sex industry. Now, it soon transpired that some of the organizations that Amnesty had consulted in order to revive at this position were headed by pimps. As Kat Barnyard showed in an amazing article, one of them, National, um, uh, um, Network of Sex Work Projects, uh, NSWP, had a vice president, Alejandra Gil from Mexico, that had been jailed, that, that was jailed for 15 years for sex trafficking. So this organization uh, was quoted by Amnesty in their material uh, when they presented uh, their uh, new stand as decriminalization, advocating for the total decriminalization of anything related to sex work. This group um, was presented as being a sex worker network and is still presented so even after uh, the vice president has been jailed for 15 years for pimping. Jill was exploiting victims of trafficking by, says one victim, driving them to hotels with her son, charging them, writing down how long they took, which is classic pimping. Why do pimps write down how long it takes? 
because they are worried that a prostituted person will do more than what is agreed and keep the money to herself. So any pimp will keep time, track the time and make sure that you know, they don't stay too long with a customer or a buyer. Now, this was not a one-time mistake. Um, Norwegian section of Amnesty has been campaigning intensely against the country's law banning the purchase of sex for a long time. So in 2016, uh, they released the report, um, the human cost of crushing the market, criminalization of sex work in Norway, uh, which was basically uh, putting down the whole law against the purchase of sex, saying it was no good, it wasn't working, it had increased uh, violence against women in prostitution and so on. You know, the usual things that proponents of prostitution would say. Now, as Norwegian feminist Agneta Strem showed, this report was highly flawed. First of all, the title. Um, the human cost of crushing the market, criminalization of sex work in Norway. Now, Norway has not criminalized sex work. Um, the Norwegian model is essentially the same as the Swedish model, which was introduced in 1999, which criminalizes the buying of sexual services and pimping, and which totally decriminalizes women in prostitution or anybody in prostitution. So basically, um, the Swedish model, which now is called equality model by some, uh, which has extended to Norway, um, France, and several other countries, um, essentially decriminalizes the people who sell sex more than, uh, for example, the German model. In the German model, um, the whole sex industry is legal, but it is illegal for uh, people in prostitution to, for example, be soliciting on the street outside a church, outside a school, or in certain areas, which they can be fined for. It is also mandatory for people in prostitution to register and to pay taxes. So um, the formulation of this instead of actually focusing on the legislation in itself, which is about banning the purchase of women's bodies. This amnesty report pretends, even in the title, that Norway has criminalized sex work, which is totally untrue. Now, second thing, the material uh, that this report uh, is using uh, to show that to engage in sex work has become more violent in Norway, for example, is before dates to before 2009 when the law was passed. So basically they have been interviewing people in prostitution and academics on how it is to sell sex in Norway and use that material to show that th these experiences are because of the law. When in fact, these experiences date from uh, years prior to the law. Third thing, um, this report was not an investigation. It was a collection of quotes from pro-prostitution academics. Um, four, there was no statistical evidence for the fact that violence has increased. In fact, this myth that violence against women in prostitution um, has increased because of laws against uh, the purchase of sex is a myth that is very efficient uh, because what it does is it avoids looking at the buyers of, of prostitution. It avoids looking at the pimps. And it basically reports that prostitution should exist and be legal for the women's sake. Now, the same thing has been stated in Sweden many times, also unfounded. Uh, when we evaluated um, our sex purchase law, it, uh, the report concluded there was no proof that violence should have increased because of the law. On the contrary, um, we have not had a single murder by a buyer or a pimp of a prostituted woman since the, since the middle of the 80s. Whereas in Holland where prostitution is totally legal um, and the whole sex industry is, is, uh, is, is, is legalized and uh, basically owners of brothels are considered businessmen um, there are 13 women killed every year in prostitution. So despite this, the Amnesty report um, kept on um, disseminating the myth that if you ban the purchase of sex, violence against women will increase. So the only way for men to stop beating up women in prostitution, and the only way for men to stop killing women in prostitution is to let men buy women in prostitution. Now, fifth point about that uh, report, it was a misrepresentation of victims' voices as um, 
one trafficking victim that was quoted in this report complained saying that her opinion that the sex purchase law as it's called in Norway was a good thing was omitted from the reports. Um, now when it comes to Sweden, this is very interesting because as many of you might know, the Swedish section of Amnesty International voted against um, uh, prostitution uh, being decriminalized. So also 2000 members of the Swedish section of Amnesty left Amnesty International, which was you know, the biggest drop in members that they've had um, in history. Many were appalled. And uh, you know, people were saying, well, writing letters to political prisoners is not the same thing as defending pimps, right? And uh, you know, also you have to take into account that in Sweden, uh, over eighty percent of the population support the uh, supports the ban on the purchase of sex, uh, meaning that this law is kind of very anchored within the population itself, which might explain the fact that it was the Swedish section that voted against. But it's very interesting that even so, um, the head of women's rights in the Swedish section of Amnesty seems to have very little understanding of the issue and has said numerous times that Sweden now should evaluate the law, which is said after the Norwegian report, uh, not seeming to know that we had evaluated the report just six years prior to that. Uh, I mean, should it be evaluated every year that somebody realizes we have this law? You know, and also her statements about banning um, banning the purchase of sex mimic statements that have been done by Amnesty International, um, saying that often laws can target the most vulnerable and so on, um, despite the fact that there's no evidence that the law has done so in Sweden. Now, in Amnesty's case, there could be an inbuilt bias. I don't know what uh, Isolt and Gita think have been working within the organization. It could be so that there is an inbuilt bias against anything that has to do with police and laws, uh, and that the organization might be wired to regard such functions as oppressive, which could explain why this fatalist idea that you know any law will always target the most vulnerable or any law will just punish those who sell sex is so prevalent within Amnesty. Uh, but Amnesty has become politically active in many ways that I would say deviate from its original goals. Um, they have in Sweden joined forces with the national LGBTQ organization RFSL, um, demanding that changing sex should be simple and fast and a matter of self-identification, which they tweeted just a few days ago under the hashtag trans law now, um, which is also very curious because such a law um, basically making it possible for anyone to change sex without change, changing legal sex, that is, without any contact with uh, medical care or changing anything in the body, has nothing to do with trans people. Because I guess there are very few trans people who would actually want to change only the sex in their passport and do nothing about their bodies, when the reason for making it easier to change the sex which is stated in the passport is when a person that presents as a woman comes to an airport and has a passport that says he or she is a man, you know, it complicates things. But here you have a law which basically makes it possible for anybody who is bearded and presents as a man to have in his passport that he is a woman, which is not for trans people. This is a law that's made for other people, made it easier for other people to change sex. So this is again conflating the issues and attacking women's rights using hashtags and uh, ideas that relate to the trans movement when in fact this law is for everybody else. Um, we've had in Sweden the same problem with organizations such as RFSL and the sexuality organization RFSU, which have views both ranging from mildly positive to prostitution to openly campaigning for prostitution. And they have also released so-called reports where they are uh, bashing the Swedish law and saying it should be changed. Um, also, when I released my book um, a, a month ago on the new definition of sex, I saw somebody in the comments is um, asking what could be used instead of gender ideology. I don't use the term gender ideology just because as Gita was saying, I think this term is uh, highly contaminated by uh, extreme right-wing ideas. So in my book, um, I don't really have a good term as such, but in my book, I use a new definition of sex or the new theory of sex to highlight the fact that we're dealing with 
a whole set of ideologies, a whole theory around what is sex and gender, where essentially we see a reversal of the concept of sex and gender, where what we used to call sex, meaning um, what is just innate and what you're born with, um, and gender, which has been known as a social construct, are now reversed so that we're told we're born with our gender, our gender is innate, whereas your sex is a social construct and can be changed, uh, which essentially targets the feminist movement because we are hearing familiar ideas such as social construct, such as born with, you know, social critique, and we don't really realize that the concepts have been replaced. So as to say, we are born with our gender um, and basically our gender roles are, are innate. Now, this trans law that Amnesty Sweden is promoting is again a policy that has potentially harmful consequences for women, but no such consideration seems to be taking. Um, instead, Amnesty seems to be busy debating and attacking JK Rowling on Twitter. Um, for example, stating trans rights, human rights, six times in a row from their official Twitter account, um, using the classic rhetoric of repetition that is so characteristic of that movement. It seems like the more you say the same thing again and again and again, the more it's true. Um, when it comes to surrogacy, Amnesty does not have a position and neither do most NGOs. However, I was shocked when I attended a meeting in The Hague in 2018, where an international protocol on regulating surrogacy was being drafted, something like the Hague Convention on Adoption, which would give a green light to surrogacy all over the place. Um, present were NGOs and other organizations, such as Save the, the Children, Convention of Elimination of all, all Forms of Discrimination Against Women, WHO, the UN, all were active at that meeting uh, in drafting and regulating surrogacy without having a formal decision from the organizations on whether surrogacy should be allowed at all. And I kept asking those organizations, um, do you have a formal position on this? And they were all saying, no, we don't have a formal position, but yet there they were drafting a convention on surrogacy, which basically would give the green light to surrogacy, making countries who have signed um, those points uh, eligible for reproductive tourism from, uh, from the West. Thanks, Kaisa, are you able to wind up? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, yes, I have. <laughs> Thank like, you, have sorry. sorry. <laughs> now, are we denouncing NGOs as a concept? Absolutely not. I would say some of them do very important work in many areas. I think what is important to acknowledge here is there has been a shift where some of them have been politicized against women. And I believe some of them have to be denounced publicly. Others have to be joined and changed from the inside because just as um, some people who are antithetical to women's rights have joined uh, the NGOs, uh, so we can do, and some of them, and join them as well to change from the inside. So uh, thank you. Um, that's all for me, from me for right now. <laughs>